So thank you so much, Chachari, and thank you all for sticking around toward the end of this meeting. I want to tell you about some of the work that we do at the University of Rochester, understanding the coherence processes in molecules. And um, because this is the last talk of this, uh, of this seminar, and because Rochester is technically the land of the Kodak moment, um, I want to start my talk with a Kodak moment by thanking the organizers for bringing us all together for creating this space uh, for this community of people that do not normally talk to one another, uh, discussing issues, fundamental issues in the quantum classical correspondence. No? So Denis, Francois, Cesare, Irini, and Igor. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, let me just start by saying that um, molecules are pretty amazing quantum systems. Um, they have manifolds of transitions in many regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, electronic vibrational rotations and spin. The energy levels can be chemically tuned. You can assemble them into complex architectures. They're pretty, pretty incredible. And because of this, essentially since the inception of quantum mechanics, um, chemists have had the long, the long standing dream of how do we use non-trivial quantum mechanical effects? How do we use quantum coherence to enhance molecular functions? And this, this concept has had many different versions over the years. These are some representative um, books and reviews uh, in this direction. Um, and it, the reason why we care about quantum coherence is because we need it for uh, matter interference, we need it to have control entanglement, we need it to do quantum unitary operations. And because of this, this is the essence of, is required for, is the engine behind all quantum technologies, including quantum control, quantum computation and quantum sensing. And from a more chemical perspective, we like quantum coherence because it enhances the spectroscopic features. So it makes our spectroscopy uh, better and because it unshackles us from, uh, uh, from, from, from thermal processes and allows the control of reactivity and electron transfer uh, beyond what we can do thermally. And the problem with this and the problem with this dream is that molecules um, the decoherence that kills the ability of molecules to behave, to exhibit their desirable quantum mechanical features is extremely fast. So this is a, a, a diagram that I took from Nitsen's book that he in turn took from this review by Fleming and Wallens in which they tabulate the different type of processes that could happen in molecules in time. You know, and this is in seconds. And you can see that electronic decoherence is of the order of tens of femtoseconds while vibrational decoherence is of the order of hundreds maybe thousands of femtoseconds. So they are extraordinarily fast processes and these has typically limited our ability to use a non-trivial quantum mechanical effects to control chemistry. Um, now, let me just spend just one minute uh, talking about decoherence and what I mean by decoherence such that we are all in the same page. So in decoherence, what we do is that we typically divide our quantum universe into a system part and a bath part. And our Hamiltonian will look like the Hamiltonian of a system the Hamiltonian of a bath and some interaction. Now, the system plus the environment evolves unitarily. And because of that unitary evolution, you get entanglement between system and bath degrees of freedom. So for example, if your system is some superposition state between state phi one and phi two, initially in tensor product with some bath state chi, chi upon time evolution, this initial separable state gets entangled. You get something that maybe looks like this. And now if you just, focus on the system, if you construct the density matrix of the system by first constructing the density matrix of the composite system plus bath, and then tracing over the bath degrees of freedom because you don't care about them. What you find is that at the initial time when your system is not entangled, the density matrix of your system is pure. That is, there is a very um, strict relation between the off diagonal elements and the diagonal elements of this density matrix. If you want the determinant of that matrix is zero. And upon time evolution, as you get entanglement, then the, uh, the off diagonal elements of the coherences of this density matrix uh, get modulated by the overlap of the bath states. So if these bath states become orthogonal, these off diagonal elements go away and you transition from a pure state to a mixed state. And that's what I refer to as the coherence. Okay, so if, as a measure, as a basis independent measure of the coherence, I like to work with the purity. So in purity, we've seen this quantity a few times already in this meeting. Uh, you take the density matrix of the system, you square it, and then you trace it. 
and this quantity decays with the decay of the environmental state. So if you have a decay of, this of the overlap of this environmental state, you get a decay of purity. For a system that is pure, the density matrix is idempotent. That means rho squared is equal to rho, and then trace of rho squared would be equal to one. While for a system that is mixed, then the density matrix is no longer idempotent and the purity uh, is less than one. Okay. It's a simple basis independent measure of decoherence. Now, in my group in Rochester, we tried to tackle the basic questions about decoherence research as it pertains to molecules. We want to understand how fast is the decoherence, how to quantify it, what are the basic mechanisms, how to model it, and how to overcome it. And um, let me just start by giving you an overview of our work in this direction. We have developed a theory of dissipation pathway that was from Wu Kim. Uh, we have developed a theory of decoherence time skills. I will tell you some about this today. We have worked on how useful are classical noise models to understand the decoherence. I will also tell you about that today. Uh, we have developed schemes for the electronic, uh, for controlling electron, electronic decoherence using lasers. This is the direction that we're working actively on. Um, we have worked on trying to understand the decoherence dynamics by taking into account the dynamics of the system and the environment explicitly, fully quantum mechanically. And uh, we have also explored the many body aspect of the decoherence is how does the electron electron interactions influences uh, the decoherence. Now, typically I worry about electronic decoherence. So that is our system in this case will be the electrons, the bath will be the nuclei and it will be the electron nuclear interactions what leads to entanglement between electrons and nuclei and those two electronic decoherence. Out of the many nuclear degrees of freedom that you can have in a molecule or in a molecular system in the condensed phase, vibrations, torsions, and solvent, vibrations are by far the most important contribution. And the reason why this problem is of importance is because we would like to understand the decoherence to be able to figure out how to protect it uh, as desirable for quantum technologies. But uh, from a molecular perspective, we need to understand this decoherence because it's central to the understanding and descriptions of vital processes such as photosynthesis, vision, and electron transfer. From a methodological perspective of developing um, methods, and we have seen already a couple of talks along this direction, the electronic decoherence is a basic feature of correlated electron nuclear states, and you need to be able to capture it correctly to develop approximate schemes to capture the electro vibrational evolution of molecules. Okay. So let me translate the picture of electronic decoherence of decoherence through entanglement in the context of molecules. So what I'm plotting here are, this is energy versus um, configurational space or nuclear configuration space, nuclear coordinates. And these may be potentially surfaces. This may be the ground state potentially surface. This may be the first excited state potentially surface. And here I'm plotting it in one dimension, but really these are high dimensional surfaces. If you have n nuclei, these are three n minus six dimensional surfaces. And you may begin with a ground vibrational, a, a vibrational state in this ground electronic state. And now you can come in with a very short laser pulse, an impulsive uh, laser pulse. And then what that does is that it will create an exact replica of this nuclear wave packet in an excited state potential. And now you have created a state that sort of looks like this. So a superposition between two electronic states where you have this, the same nuclear wave packet associated with the two surfaces. And then this wave packet will start to evolve in that excited state potential. And as a consequence of that evolution, you get electron nuclear entanglement. And, and now, if you look at the density matrix of the system by tracing out the nuclear degrees of freedom, what you find is that the electronic coherences, the off diagonal elements of the density matrix, get modulated by the overlap of these uh, bath states. So the basic picture to understand the electronic decoherence in molecule um, and it's a picture that it, it was originally formulated by Roski in this paper in 1996, is that the decay of the off diagonal elements in the density matrix is determined by the overlap of the nuclear wave packets in alternative electronic potential surfaces. So that's the basic picture that we, that we work with. Okay. Now, in, if, if you think about it from a system plus environment, this is an environment that is non-Markovian and for which the back action is key. That is the electrons induce nuclear motion and then the nuclear motion will lead to electronic transitions. So it, it really requires hopefully a full quantum description of the electron nuclear evolution or at least a very good approximation. And I think you have seen efforts already well represented in this conference by Capral, Gross, Burkhardt, 
Agostini, uh, Ismailov and Di Maiolo uh, describing how to do this in a variety of schemes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start my work on the coherence really started about maybe 10 years ago um, in work that we did with Paul. Um, and we were starting, we were investigating the coherence in polyacetylene. And this is a linear carbon chain in this chain with N carbon atoms. And we were creating an initial superposition between the ground state and the first excited state. And as a measure of the decoherence, we were watching the polarization, which also decays with the overlap of these nuclear states. And we could select the different, the, the, the size of that carbon chain, 20 atoms, 20, 50 carbon atoms, 100 carbon atoms. And we were doing our simulations using a mixed quantum classical scheme. Uh, in, in particular, it was, this was an RNFest mixed quantum classical scheme in which the initial conditions were obtained by sampling the, initial, the big net distribution for the nuclei and then taken in sample averages. Okay, so this is the type of dynamics that we were getting. This is the polarization as a function of time. And for a chain with 20 carbon atoms, we will get an initial decay of the polarization. This is that uh, wave packet. So we started, we were here and that wave packet will move out of overlap and will lead to a decay of the polarization. And then some of that wave packet will come back, no? It will bounce back and then it will get a recurrence of that polarization and then a decay and then a recurrence. And eventually you see no recurrences. And when you go to larger systems, what happens is that that wave packet gets lost in that configuration of space, that, that nuclear configuration of space, and you no longer see that recurrence. And essentially the electronic coherence is determined by that initial Gaussian decay, that decay of the, polar, of, of the overlap of, between the two wave packets. And that process is very fast. It's of the order of something like tens of femtoseconds. Okay, so um, when we were doing this, the, first of all, we didn't know how accurate the simulations were. Um, and the other picture that, the, the other thing that bugged me and that has bugged me for a number of years is that the quantum and the quantum classical description of the decoherence were extraordinarily different. So in the quantum picture of decoherence, one quantum system gets entangled, uh, system and bath get entangled and that leads to a decay of the uh, of diagonal elements and a decay of purity. While in the quantum classical picture of the decoherence is very different, what we do is that we create many replicas of my initial quantum mechanical state. So these are supposed to be the many replicas. Each of them has a slightly different initial, configure, initial conditions. And because of this, the energy levels, uh, just to give one example, the dynamics of the energy levels of that quantum classical scheme for each copy will be exact, will be slightly different. You know? And then I average over them. And if I have a phase that is accumulated over time because of these dynamics of the energy levels, each of these phases for each member of my quantum classical ensemble will be different. And when I take an ensemble average, as a consequence of the ensemble average, I, I get a, a loss of this of diagonal elements. So in quantum classical schemes, one trajectory doesn't exhibit decoherence. You need that ensemble average to get the decoherence. While in the quantum picture, the decoherence occurs through entanglement and it occurs at a, at a single entity level. Okay. So that motivated the couple of questions that I think will, I hope will guide my talk today. The first question is to what extent can classical bath models accurately capture the decoherence? Um, and a second related question is when can we really mimic the decoherence by classical noise, not quantum noise, but, but classical noise. So a, our approach has been to do explicit quantum dynamic simulations of the, simul of, of the decoherence. We have, this, we have constructed a theory of early time decoherence time scales that I will tell you about that allows us to approach this problem. And we have also investigated the validity of classical noise models. And this is the subject of my talk today. Okay, so explicit quantum so quantum simulations. So the first thing that we wanted to do is to be able to model the decoherence dynamics of electrons and nuclei exactly and be in a situation in which we were not making any approximations. And even in a situation in which we were not even requiring the born oppenheimer approximation to be correct. And the way that we do this is that we uh, try to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation in, in this case is for polyacetylene by a representing the electronic degrees of freedom in matrix form through this inverse Jordan big transformation of the creation and relation operators. 
we represent the nuclear degrees of freedom through what is called the discrete variable representation. And now we have a giant matrix of both the electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom. And we just propagate that matrix, that dynamics um, using the crank Nicholson approach. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't really require the concept of a potential surface. It turns out that the biggest thing that you can put in the computer using that exact scheme is uh, four electrons and two vibrations. And so this is, this is polyacetylene, so it's a linear carbon chain. It has four carbon atoms, but the two, the two carbon atoms on the air are clamped. And at the end, you get two vibrations. And what you get, the dynamics that you get out of that, this is the nuclear wave packet as a function of time. And here, what I have is the purity as a function of time. And what you see is that that wave packet, that initial wave packet will start to move out of overlap. These are nuclear coordinates. This is one nuclear coordinate, and that's the other nuclear coordinate. And they will come back. And eventually, if you went long, long enough, because that potentially surfaces are slightly unharmonic, that nuclear wave packet will spread. And if you look at it in terms of the purity, what you see is that the purity decays like a Gaussian. No? Initially, this is the, what we saw before, and eventually it will come back as that Gaussian, as that wave packet will come, nuclear wave packet will come back again, and it will decay and come back, decay and come back. And if you wait long enough, you will get a systematic decay of purity due to the anharmonicities in the potential. And if you keep waiting, eventually you will get a full recurrence because this is a finite dimensional system. Okay, so using this method, we could then compare a, what we get out of this exact quantum dynamics with the mixed quantum classical dynamics using the error test. And a, the curves that we should be looking at is the black one, which is the, the, the exact one, and the orange one, which is the error test. And a, you see that for short times, they agree, no? That's perfectly fine. And the mean, and the quantum one is the black one, and you see that the error test gets the recurrent structure but overall, it exaggerates the decoherence. So what these simulations were indicating were, were that the mixed quantum classical schemes were accurate in the short time limit, but not necessarily accurate in the long time limit. And that if your dynamics is completely dominated by this early time decay, then they had a, cho a chance of capturing the decoherence correctly. Okay, so in these initial insights evolved and I want to tell you how we have approached this problem uh, through a completely different uh, strategy that allows us to go to bigger systems than what we can do through explicit quantum dynamic simulations. So I'm going to introduce a theory of early time decoherence time skills that will provide a relation between the dynamics of purity at short times and the fluctuations of the operators that enter into the system bath coupling. It is general and simple. It's, um, is valid for any system bath Hamiltonian with an initially pure system. There is no need to reconstruct the density matrix. And it's useful to establish the coherence times for basic chemical and, chemical and physical processes. And in the context of this talk, it will be useful to test approximate quantum dynamics methods. OK, so what do we do? We start with the Bill Voinomen equation for system and environment. This is the equation that we do. We expand that equation up to second order in time. That's a shorthand expansion. This is around time is equal to zero up to second order in time. We trace over the bath to get the equivalent expansion, but for the density matrix of the system up to second order in time. And we assume that our, initially, that our system is initially pure. So we assume that the, our density matrix is initially separable and that the sigma for the system is initially pure. We take our system bath interaction to be of this bilinear form, no, and, and all, form, all, 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 all interactions that I have seen can be expressed in this form. And then a, you go and sit there with a giant cup of coffee and calculate purity and enjoy the massive cancellation of terms. And what you get is something very, very simple, very, very beautiful. What you get is that the linear order in the expansion cancels and that only the second order survive. So if you want, that's a, like an, a manifestation of the quantum Zeno effect. And so the purity decays like a Gaussian and there's a time scale associated with that decay. And that's what we call the, the decoherence time scale. And in these terms here are really, this is the sum alpha over beta are the terms that enter into the system bath coupling. And these terms here are the, the covariances, the co initial cross fluctuations of the bath operators and the system operators that enter into the system bath cup. Okay, so once you have this, um, well, I, so I, I should say that it, this, 
does not require the full density matrix. You can calculate these covariances. It does not invoke common approximations such as Markovian dynamics, rotating wave, pure defacing, weak coupling, or harmonic paths. It's a, it's a general thing. The physical idea behind this is that the larger the fluctuations of the operators in, that enter into the system buff coupling, the faster the decoherence. And this is best seen when you only have one term in the system buff coupling term, and you see that this decoherence time is inversely related to the uh, fluctuations of, 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 of the bath operators and the system operators at the initial time. So if you couple through position, the larger the fluctuations of position at the initial time, the faster the decoherence that you will get. Okay. Now, how the question that you may ask is how valid is the initial Gauss indicate? So the general answer to this is not known yet. This is something that we're working on. However, there are full quantum simulations of electronic decoherence in large molecules. For example, this one that I'm showing, that I'm showing here that actually show that this Gaussian, this Gaussian decay can be dominant to capture the electronic decoherence in large molecules. It, there are also simulations for vibrational decoherence that suggest the same thing, um, but this is really much, pretty much an open question so far. Okay, once you have that formula, uh, within a couple of lines, you can recover expressions that have been developed in the literature. You can recover the formula for electronic decoherence by Preston and Roski. You can recover the formula for vibrational decoherence by Kim and Borges. Um, and you can develop new formulas. In particular, we have used it to develop a generalized theory of electronic decoherence that reveals pure defacing electronic transitions and their interference contributions to the decoherence. And there's a whole program that we have in our group exploring this formula for, for further um, inquiries. Now, we have also compared the th that theory in the high temperature limit with numerically exact computations in the displaced harmonic oscillator model using um, the hierarchical equation of motion method. And the hierarchical equation of motion method is shown by the solid lines and the theory predictions are shown by the blast lines. And you can see that they're in reasonable agreement. Okay. Now, um, the other way to use this theory is to test approximate quantum dynamics methods. And this is useful because not always we have an exact reference a full quantum solution uh, to whatever what we want, whatever modeling what we want to do. Okay, so one idea is to use um, is essentially to develop the coherence time scales associated with your approximate um, quantum dynamics scheme. And as a particular example, I want to focus on mixed quantum classical approximations, in which we mimic the quantum dynamics by an ensemble of mixed quantum classical trajectories and then take ensemble averages. So the quantum system, each copy will satisfy a, a Liouville equation where the Hamiltonian will depend parametrically on the coordinates of our classical bath. This classical bath will satisfy some equation of motion. And at the end of the day, I am taking an ensemble average over this swarm of quantum classical trajectories. And now the question is whether this mixed quantum classical schemes can capture the decoherence correctly. Okay. So, um, we take our coupling between the system and the environment to be of this form where the S alpha is, a, is an operator of the system. And this is a function of the classical bath. And this could be either a function of position or a function of momentum, but not both. No? And, and what you can do is that you can take your equations of motion for your mixed quantum classical dynamics, and you can do the same short time analysis and you can reconstruct a, a, de a, a decoherence time scale for that mixed quantum classical scheme that looks exactly like this. And you can contrast it with the fully quantum one. And what you can see is that they look exactly the same, except that now these initial covariances of the bath that were fully quantum, um, that were fully quantum for the quantum case, now are being replaced by these covariances obtained as an average, these overlines are averages over the initial ensemble. So that means that if my initial ensemble of any conditions is able to mimic the quantum fluctuations of my initial quantum mechanical state, my uh, mixed quantum classical dynamics will get the early time decoherence co dynamics correctly. So for example, if I use, if I sample from the quantum Bigner distribution and I couple through position or momentum, then uh, I will get these initial um, fluctuations correctly, and I will be able to capture the decoherence uh, dynamics, at least the early times correctly. If I couple through position and momentum, 
then um, I don't know of any classical distribution that can capture the exact quantum distributions and that this whole thing will fail. Okay, so just to convince you that that is correct, uh, this is the purity dynamic as a function of time in the context of the SSI chain. And in black, I'm showing the exact quantum dynamics and the color lines are all sort of mixed quantum classical approximations. And you can see that provided that we are sampling from the initial Wigner distribution, um, then all these approximations are sampling the purity that are getting the, purity, the correct purity dynamics, at least for early times correctly. So if we are in the condensed phase and the, the, and, and the decoherence dynamics is only governed by this initial wave packet, this initial decay of nuclear wave packets, um, then these mixed quantum classical schemes will provide an adequate description of, of, of the decoherence dynamics. Okay, so now I would like to uh, move on to the second question of when can quantum decoherence be mimicked by classical noise? And um, let, me, let me frame this question in the following way. So I have argued that quantum decoherence arises through entanglement between the system and bath degrees of freedom, and that this requires uh, either full quantum dynamics or, or good semi-classical or effective master equations. But oftentimes to think about the decoherence and to model it, I, I just do a simple uh, process in which I think that the environment introduces classical noise, not quantum noise, classical noise. For example, in this particular uh, example that we have actually worked on, this is a two level system that is embedded in a thermal environment. And the effect of that thermal environment is to lead to random diffusion of these energy levels. And you can see how those energy levels are randomly diffusing um, over time. And the question is, when is this picture, uh, can, when can this picture be employed to mimic the full quantum entanglement that leads to the decoherence? Now, just to convince you, I mean, I, I, these phenomenological noise models are very popular um, they're everywhere. Uh, Kubo used them to develop a theory of optical line shifts, uh, Stern to describe the loss of interference, Kayanuma to describe Landau center processes in the presence of decoherence. There have been proposals to use them for environmental mediated energy transfer, non-Markovian dynamics, open many body systems. And, and the question is how, 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 when, when can I use this classical noise to mimic the quantum decoherence? Okay, so I will divide the problem into two parts. I will focus first on the pure defacing dynamics. And by this, I mean a case in which the system Bath Hamiltonian couples commutes with the system Hamiltonian. And in these processes, the environment interact with the system, but it does not lead to net energy loss for the system. The energy of the system still conserved. And then I will focus on the dissipative case in which this, this, this commutator is no longer zero. And um, while the pure defacing dynamics, I think is, pretty general, at least for a chemist. No? Uh, uh, the, the quantum dissipation case will be in, in a very specific case of a two level system interacting with a thermal bath. Okay. So let's focus about the quantum pure defacing. And so I write my system bath interaction in this form uh, where these alpha are eigenstates of my system operators. And in this way, I can guarantee that there's no e net energy exchange between system and environment. I suppose that at the initial time, my system and environment are initially uh, separable. And then using that in the interaction picture, if I work in the interaction picture, I can show uh, readily that the matrix elements of the density matrix of my system, the alpha beta matrix element of the density matrix of my system over time will be given by the matrix element initial time. And then this function, this, um, this phi alpha beta that is called the decoherence function, and which looks like this. It's a trace over the bath of the density matrix of the bath of these unitary operators, uh, V beta and V alpha. And these unitary operators are time order exponentials of the bath operators in the interaction picture. Okay, so, but the structure is, it's, it's simple. This tells me, this decoherence function tells me how the, the off diagonal elements of my density matrix decay over time due to the interaction with the system, a bit of the system with the environment. Now, I can do the same thing with the classically, with the noise induced process. I can write down the Hamiltonian, I can write down a system, I can write down an interaction with the noise, and I can also make it a uh, pure defacing. So there's no 
So this, this essentially is just leading to my energy levels to go um, to diffuse over time. And I can write down, do the same analysis, write down an equation of motion, take an ensemble average and it work in the interaction picture. And I can find out that the alpha beta matrix element of the density matrix of my system, I can write it as a product of the initial uh, alpha beta matrix element of the density matrix and this noise induced decoherence function. And this decoherence function now is, um, it's, it's a phase that accumulates from time zero to time t, where this is the noise induced on level alpha, and this is the noise on level beta, and it's the difference between the two of them. And I'm taking, I'm, uh, I'm taking the accumulated phase that I get over my quantum evolution, and I'm taking my ensemble average. Okay, so you see the treatment is analogous. I, both of them have a decoherence function. This is the quantum decoherence function. That's the noise induced decoherence function. These are the expressions for the elements that go into that decoherence function. And if you want noise that mimics your quantum decoherence, in principle, the only thing that you need is for those decoherence functions to be identical for all levels involved. Okay, so that's nice. Formally, it's great. But at the end of the day, for a practicing chemist like myself, it's not very practical because it doesn't allow me to calculate. So the way forward or the way that we have found to move forward is by performing a cumulant expansion. And so you can perform a cumulant expansion of that decoherence function. This requires taking those operators and moving them into a contour, uh, uh, into the contour in which you go in the upper uh, imaginary plane for when you move forward in time and you go backward in time in the lower imaginary plane. And if you do that, you can by doing this trick of moving into the contour, then you can take this decoherence function and perform a cumulant expansion where these are different cumulants. And you can actually isolate a recurrence relation for that cumulant where the cumulant of order n is determined by all other cumulants of lower order. And where these mu's are the moments of the bath operators expressed in that contour. Uh, and this is now a time order Time, time ordering operator, but defining the contour for the operators of the bath that couple to the system. And you can also do that for the classical decoherence. You can take your noise, you can explain, you can do a cumulant expansion, you get the same recurrence relation. And now these mu are the moments of the different moments of the noise. And now if you want the noise to, 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 to mimic your quantum decoherence, you can, instead of thinking about the whole uh, uh, decoherence function, you can just require that the different moments of the classical noise and the quantum decoherence coincide. That the first moment coincides, that the second moment coincides, and so on and so forth. And if you're able to guarantee that all moments coincide, then in your noise, you can synthesize noise that mimics a given quantum process. So just to give you an example of how that works, we, we work this out in, in a representative case in which we have a, this is what is called the spin boson problem. So it's a two level system, which is the Pauli Z matrix, a, coupled to a, a harmonic environment and is coupled in this case through position. And the effect of that environment is just to shift a little bit the energy levels around. And um, we take the, 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 the coupling between system and environment to be described by the spectral density uh, which we suppose that is of the omnic type. And we compare this to a, a classical uh, noise driven process in which you just have a two level system that is driven by noise. And we take that noise to be um, a colored exponentially correlated noise with a, a correlation time one over omega C and with a strength of the noise related to the temperature in this way. Ten and five minutes including questions. Yes, that's right. And, uh, and by using this, this calculation scheme, what you can show is that this classical noise induced model is equivalent to the fully quantum model for the high temperature limit. No? So in the high temperature limit, you can do the quantum dynamics in this way, or you can uh, do the quantum, the, I guess the noise induced dynamics in this way, and you will get exactly the same, the same answer. And for, for us, that was, that was a very nice connection between noise-induced models and, 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 and full quantum dynamics.
Okay, just to convince you that that is correct, what I'm plotting here is the coherence as a function of time uh, for this spin boson problem. And in black, I'm showing the exact quantum dynamics and in the color line is the one induced by noise. And you can see that they both coincide. Okay, now in, I want to move on now to the quantum dissipation case. And this will be in the context of a very specific problem, but I think it, it already captures the essential um, the essential difference and the similarities between noise induced decoherence and, and quantum decoherence, okay, which would be a two level system interacting with a thermal bath. So it turns out that you can, for a Markovian thermal environment, uh, people have written um, the Liouville equation of motion for that two level model interacting uh, with that environment. And it looks like this. So this is the systematic part of the evolution. In blue here, uh, this is the emission of energy where these sigma plus are excitation operators and these sigma minus are the excitation operators for my two level system. And in red here, I, this is the absorption of energy. And you see that the rate of emission and the rate of absorption are different because in the emission, it has the same rate as the absorption, but it has an additional contribution that comes because of a spontaneous emission of photons, phonons, and so on and so forth. This is the full quantum answer. And now we can tackle the same problem for the noise driven process. And we write down the Hamiltonian. This is the Hamiltonian of the system. And now I couple it with a noise. So it's still a Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, this is the, the, the noisy process. And I, I'm supposing that my noise either de excites my system or excites my system. And I take the noise um, to be white noise of strength sigma. And using that Hamiltonian and taking ensemble averages, I can write down an equation of motion for the density matrix of my system. And at the end of the day, you get an equation of motion that looks like this. This is the systematic part of the evolution. This is the emission of energy and the, the absorption of energy. And you see this equation of motion looks exactly the same as the one that we got in for the full quantum case with one difference that while for this classical noise process, the rate of emission gamma is the same rate of absorption gamma. No? Uh, for the full quantum case, the rate of emission and the rate of absorption differed because the full quantum case also included the spontaneous emissions of photons and photons. So this means that the classical noise cannot capture spontaneous emission and because the classical noise cannot capture spontaneous emission, but it can capture everything else, the model is valid in, in the infinitely high temperature limit. No? The, the classical noise model is valid in the infinitely high temperature limit. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, I hope I was um, able to show you um, that, so I introduced a general relation for early time decoherence time skills that relates purity dynamics to initial fluctuations of operators that couple a quantum system with a surrounding bath. And using it, uh, we concluded that a large class of mixed quantum classical approaches can reproduce the early time decoherence exactly when you use classical distributions that mimic quantum fluctuations. And in fact, we were able to show this through explicit quantum dynamic simulations of the decoherence through numerically exact methods. Now, in the second part of the talk uh, about the validity of classical noise models, um, I introduce quantum and classical decoherence functions and their expansion in terms of cumulants. And, and in particular, the expansion in terms of cumulants is the most important of that part. And using that, we concluded that these classical noise models can reproduce the exact purity phasing dynamics if the cumulants coincide at all orders. And in this context, we showed that um, our exponentially correlated noise actually coincides with the spin boson problem at the high temperature limit for a particular class of environment, the, um, the omnic environment. Um, classical noise can capture many of the processes in, that, that lead to relaxation and, uh, in, in, in a quantum system, but it cannot capture spontaneous emission of photons and phonons, and therefore classical noise models for, uh, for relaxation are only valid in the high temperature limit. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. And this is my group at the University of Rochester, which is which are the people that really did all this work. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, time for questions.
No questions? Uh, I have one. Um, Please. So, uh, Ignacio, nice talk. Uh, but uh, one thing I kind of maybe missed, uh, which is quite technical, uh, the contour part. Uh, why do you need contour for the cumulant expansion? Like, and to go into the complex uh, plane. Yeah, so you you need you need it because you want one of the exponential is in one side of the operator and the other exponentials on the other side of the in there are two exponentials and you want to combine them into one exponential such that you can do a cumulant expansion and the way to com to combine them is by defining those exponentials in the contour uh -huh. and you cannot do it uh, without doing contour because no i guess you can i technically you can it's just simpler a uh, uh, once you define it in the contour, yeah. Uh, so technically, if you work hard, sure, you can you can just expand that and then work hard and then get your cumulative expansion. But if you combine them into one single exponential, then your cumulative expansion is, is much easier. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Next question. Uh, I guess it was who? Which one? Who was first? The Aussie? The Irene. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, regarding the classical noise models, um, did you think of uh, correlated fluctuations? Like, um, so in, imagine a delocalized quasi-particle state, like, you know, church or an exciton, I so, say, uh, typically correlated fluctuations will play an important role. So to what extent do you like these classical noise models, which sort of, you know, work in terms of this co coherent dephasing, as you put it, right? To what extent would that actually interact in the same way with an entangled state as the quantum noise? Okay, so um, the only thing that I can say is that we have a, a way in which you can take your quantum system and figure out what you need out of that classical noise, you know, and then try to see if you can synthesize noise that, that can do that by comparing the cumulants. You know. um, now, this whole thing is limited. Maybe there are many mathematicians here, and maybe they have clever ways of uh, computationally generating noise that goes beyond exponentially correlated. I only know how to generate the white noise and exponentially correlated noise, but I'm sure that there are ways around there in which you can do something better. And if you can do something better, then you can go to more challenging problems like the one that you are proposing, Professor Porter. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Professor Dios. Yeah, a question and, and a remark. The question is simple. Uh, how is it possible that the, or why is that so, that the rotation of DNA is so robust against decoherence? I remember uh, uh, the, ro the rotational motion of DNA uh, had the longest uh, coherence time. So the, this is my question. And, and the remark is that if for purposes of simulation, you don't mind to have uh, imaginary and complex noise, then even dissipative systems can be simulated uh, in a similar way like, like uh, your decoherence. But you have to admit using complex noise. Yes, I, I agree. So uh, this was classical real noise. And there are people that use complex noise and they are able to make mappings of exact quantum dynamics to, to this quantum noise. So I agree with that comment. The first comment I didn't understand, Professor Diossi. Uh, so it was a question. Question. Yes. Uh, if, if my memory uh, doesn't cheat me, uh, in the beginning of your talk, mm -hmm. or maybe in the previous talk, I, I'm not sure, you have a table of typical decurrence times oh. in new uh, in uh, atom in molecular systems. Yes. May, yes. Yes. That was that. And yes, uh, on, on the right hand side, at the bottom, apparently the longest coherence time belongs to torsional dynamics of DNA. Uh, how is that, and why is that? Why? Uh, a torsional motion of, of DNA is so robust. Um, 
torsional motion of DNA. Yeah, but I think that's not about the coherence times. That's just the time that it takes for torsional motion. I think the the the, the, the decoherence times are the only two that are here are the electronic okay. decoherence <laughs> and vibrational decoherence. But yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, then, but that's clear. My, okay. my fault. <laughs> no, no, no. It's so. But what is interesting is that if you think about the electronic decoherence due to coupled to vibrations and you think about vibrational decoherence due to coupled to electrons and you have in your mind the Schmidt theorem, these two should coincide. No? So what is surprising to me at the beginning was why not the vibrational decoherence and the electronic decoherence are in the same time scale. And the reason for this is because in this table, they're thinking about electronic decoherence due to coupled to vibrations, but vibrational decoherence due to coupled to solvent. No. So they're just different environments. And this is the reason why they have different time scales. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.